All right. Hey, church. It's so good to have every one of you with us today. In case you're new, my name's Matt. Good to have you here. And uh, we have uh, others who are with us over our Modern Hymns service. And we have, uh, uh, we have people all over the place today joining us online. We've got, uh, we have JB. We have uh, Seth and Noah over in Africa. We've got Steph up in South Dakota, Brian and the team in Poland. We've got California, Wyoming, Montana. I mean, I-35. I mean, we've got people everywhere. So, hey, if you're in the room, welcome them in. Good to have every one of you with us wherever you are across the world. So glad to have you. Um, as uh, was mentioned a moment ago, we do have our uh, youth Quakers out in Colorado, uh, 104 students all together. We've got about 150 out in the mountains where it's beautiful and cool. <sighs> anyway, um, we're not jealous at all, but uh, we're excited. They are there. Things are off. They got off to a little bumpy start, a little delayed start uh, Friday night with the storm that came in, but they got there and uh, all is going well. Our Poland team is, has arrived. They have made it uh, to their destination and getting ready to start all that they're going to be doing. And so uh, we're excited about them. So I wanted us to just take a moment to just pray over, especially our youth Quakers and our Poland team as they are out and about and uh, serving as well as being filled up out in the mountains. So let's, uh, let's pray for them right now. Father, uh, we thank you uh, that we uh, have been able to send off our students, that they've been able to go out be in your creation. And God, we lift up all of our students to you, our senior hires. God, we just pray that you will um, use this week to uh, grow them. Uh, God, that uh, this may be a week that some of them come to know you and take a step to go all in with you. And uh, God, we pray that uh, this will just be a fantastic week out in the mountains of Colorado for them. We pray for all of our leaders, our, our adults who are there to, to lead, to teach, to uh, counsel, to do all that they're going to do in the lives of those kids. We just pray that you would use them and bless them this week and their time away. And so we lift that crew up to you. God, we lift our Poland team to you. And we pray that uh, you will do great things through them as they serve and as they uh, work with those that they're going to be working with there in Poland at the camp. And God, we pray that it'll be a great week, uh, that they will be blessed, but that those that they work with will be blessed even more as they receive um, and, and experience your love uh, through our team. And so we, uh, we lift that team to you. God, we thank you for what you're doing in this place. And we just lift this time to you and pray that you would just bless us as we open up your word here in just a moment. God, we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Well, hey, we are in week four of our Mixtape Volume 4 series. So hopefully you've been here over the last couple of weeks and, uh, and caught up with where we've been. If you've, you have missed, be sure to go check it out, see where we've been over the last several weeks. It's been a good series so far, all right? I believe uh, that we all, inside of us, I think we have a desire for unity. I, I think we, we desire to be in harmony with everyone around us, unless you're like an anarchist, you know, and just love to be, you know, against everybody. Um, I, I think inside of us, we, we wanna be in unity. I, I think we're created in the image of God, God being the Trinity, you know, and there's unity there. I think, I think it's just built within us to, to desire to be, in, in harmony and unity with others. I, I think that's why songs like, and some of you will remember this, We Are the World, remember 1985? Came out and uh, all to bring people together for famine relief in Africa. And uh, songs like that, every once in a while, they'll jump up to the top, they'll hit the top of the charts. And I think it's because there's this, again, this desire for us to be in unity, to come together for a, a cause, to do something together. There's always this kind of hope for, for this utopian society where there's just peace and love and harmony, right? And we desire that, we want that. But the reality is that the world we live in could probably be better described as a jungle, <laughs> where it's kind of survival of the fittest and songs like Welcome to the Jungle by Guns N' Roses that came out in, 90, in 87, just a few years after uh, We Are the World, that one came out, and I'm pretty sure that was on my pregame mix tape. Um, but that one came out, and when they wrote that, it was a 
depiction of the streets of L.A., and if you look at the lyrics of that song, it is, uh, there's a picture painted of deception, pain, greed, and even death. <laughs> That's probably a little better <laughs> description of the world that we live in, not a lot of peace and harmony. We, we live in a, in a jungle, a world of chaos. But in that world, people are searching for and looking for peace. You've probably... Uh, Heard the story before, it's a cheesy little story about the guy that was uh, stranded on a desert island for all by himself for years and finally somebody found him and the team came to rescue him but before they would take him off the island he wanted to show him around, right? And so he took them uh, to his hut and said, yeah, this is the, the hut that I built with my own two hands. I'm like, wow, that's neat. And, and then he took him to another building and said, this is the church that, that I built with my own two hands, this is my church. And, and then one of the rescuers saw another building and said, well, what's that building over there? He says, oh, that's my old church. <laughs> See, the one place that the world should be able to find peace and harmony and unity should be the church, but unfortunately, that's not what the church is always known for, right? The church is probably better known for dissension, divisiveness, and disunity. But yet unity is something that we all seek and desire. Unity is something, I mean, sports teams, teams need unity. If they don't have unity, they, they lose. If businesses don't have unity, eventually they're gonna fold up. Uh, unity is needed in families. When you don't have unity within the, within the family, there's dysfunction, even divorce. And unity is needed in the church. When a church is not unified, there is division, there is hurt, and worst of all, lost people are turned away from Jesus. The Bible talks more about unity in the church than it does either heaven or hell. And that's why it's that, it's, it's important. It's that important. So if you've been in the church long, You've probably seen conflict. You've probably experienced conflict. Um, it's there. And when you've experienced a church in conflict, a church that's dysfunctional, it makes you appreciate all the more when you find a church that is walking in unity. Now, First Church is not immune. <laughs> we have gone through our seasons of disunity and strife and struggle. But thankfully, uh, it's been in those seasons that, uh, and I can look back on a specific season that I know our leaders here made some very specific decisions that changed the trajectory of this church, really setting us up for what we are experiencing today, a great time of of unity. And, and also don't think, <laughs> I, th I thought about this while I was writing this message, uh, some uh, might get the idea that, oh, there must be trouble in the church stuff happening, bad things, people are griping. Oh, it's the three services, oh no. Oh, yeah. No, <laughs> that's not it, all right? Uh, it's just, there are times that we need to talk about unity because it is, again, uh, it's so important. We see it over and over in God's word. And though we're experiencing a great season now, we are also not naive to the schemes of our enemy, the devil, that he hates unity in the church, right? All he wants to do is divide and destroy the church. And so we know that he's scheming and he's working. So, so we need to talk about unity as a church. So we're gonna be over in Psalm chapter 130. Three is where we're going to be at today. Psalm 133, as, as you know, if you've been here with us in mixtape, we've been walking through some different psalms, this, this book of songs, a mixtape of sorts of songs. And so uh, today we're going to land there in Psalm 133. Now, what you will notice if you turn over there or pull that up, uh, there's only three verses, right? It, this is like my kind of song. I mean, I, one of the reasons I picked, I was like, hey, this is short. I can make a short sermon. Thank you, Scott. All right. <sighs> 
but don't get your hopes up. Anyway, um, so let's dive in. Subscript uh, or description of this song starts off with that uh, simple little uh, description there. A song of a sense of David. The Song of Ascents of David. Now, uh, th- this is part of what we call the Psalms of Ascents. There's 15 of them from Psalm 120 to 134. And uh, literally, it means Psalms of going up. So these were songs that the Israelite people knew um, and recited and even chanted as they would make their way to Jerusalem, to the temple for all the different celebrations, right? So they're converging on Jerusalem. Jerusalem was a city that was known for its elevation. So you were actually typically going up, ascending to Jerusalem. And so that's why they call these the songs of ascent, climbing up, going up to Jerusalem. And again, these were songs that the people of Israel, as they ascended, would just sing, would chant. And they would remind them of God, remind them of who they are as a people as they head out uh, to to the celebration. So this one in particular is written by David, it says there, uh, possibly after he was crowned king and all the tribes have come together in this moment of his crown being crowned have come together in unity. And so he's praising this moment. So he begins in verse one there, says, behold how good and how pleasant it is for brothers to live together in unity. He begins with behold, right? This is a, that's a big word saying, hey, this is special. What's happening right now is awesome, right? And so you, we need to think about this moment and how special it is, how good and how pleasant it is as we gather together in unity. It's good because unity in God's, of God's people is what God desires. So so this is a good thing and it's pleasant because (laughs) no one's fighting, right? There's no bickering going on. Everybody's in harmony and this is, this is just pleasant, right? You know, maybe you just dream of that day in your home, right? When the kids get out of here, oh, it's gonna be so pleasant. Good luck. Anyway, um, but no, he says, hey, it's so good and so pleasant as we come together, as brothers and sisters, we come together in unity. Literally, as we come together means that as we sit together. And so the idea is, hey, they're all converging onto Jerusalem. They're coming together and they are literally sitting, right? They're, they're, they're having meals together. And a lot of times it's with people that they don't know, right? And, and, but yet they are still coming together in unity because they're coming together for one purpose and that is to worship God. And so it says, man, when we come together in unity, this is good and this is pleasant. Now we're together there even. Uh, there's a lot packed in that little word because it's not just about physically coming together, we're heading to Jerusalem, but there's a spiritual connection there that we're together spiritually as, as brothers and sisters. So as the people would come together, they would celebrate and have a oneness as they come together and celebrate God. Now, it's not unlike what we experience here each week. As we come together, as we gather for worship with fellow believers, many of which you don't know. I mean, you you look to your left and right and it's like, yeah, don't know you, yeah, don't know. You know, it's like, yeah. And we hear that all the time. There's so many people here I don't know. Isn't it awesome? (laughs) but we come together with one cause, one purpose to worship and lift up the name of Jesus. We come together in unity and this is special. And we need to look even beyond our walls because there are churches all over the world that are coming together on this day, this first day of the week set aside to to worship and we're in unity with with them as well. And we need to recognize that. David goes on, verse two, to describe how special this is. He uses a couple of metaphors here. He begins in verse two with, it's like precious oil poured on the head, running down on the beard, running down on Aaron's beard, down upon the collar of his robes. This precious oil, 
oil. He, he's not talking about like Quaker State full synthetic, right? I mean, that's, that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about an, the anointing oil that's being poured upon uh, Aaron. And you might be going, well, who's Aaron? Aaron's the high priest. Aaron's the brother of Moses. So this is a very symbolic statement that he's making here, but it's the anointing oil on Aaron, the high priest, setting him apart for God's work. And this oil pours down over his head, through his beard, onto his clothes. This isn't just a sprinkling. There is an abundance of this fragrant oil that's being poured out on him to set him apart for the Lord's work. Now, it's interesting, as we talk about Aaron, he's right in the middle of this, this song. And Aaron, uh, most would say, Aaron represents Jesus, uh, in, this, in this passage. Jesus being our high priest, Jesus being the center of all things, created the head of the church. And, and so Aaron's this foreshadowing of, of Jesus. The, the oil that pours over him and just drenches Aaron is a, is a representation of the Holy Spirit that is poured out over us as his followers and poured out in abundance. And and this fragrant oil that anybody who would be in the presence of the, of the high priest as he's being anointed, they would smell it and they would all be blessed by this beautiful fragrance. And likewise, when the church gets it right, when we're walking under the headship of Jesus and in the power and leading of the Holy Spirit, we're to be this aroma, beautiful aroma, fragrance everywhere we go, bringing love and joy into the communities that we find ourselves in. We're to be a pleasant, sweet aroma to those around us. David finishes up there in verse three when he says, it's as if the dew of Hermon were falling on Mount Zion. For there the Lord bestows his blessing, even life forevermore. Now that's an interesting little sentence or a little phrase in this song. As if the dew of Hermon were falling on Mount Zion. Mount Hermon was a mountain that was up into the north. It was known for its snow-capped mountains. Always had snow on it. And it was known for the dew that would fall. Very uh, lush, very um, moist, uh, always had water. There was always life there on Mount Hermon. Compared to Mount Zion, that was dry, and dusty, and barren, David says, oh, man, it'd be like if, the, if you took the dew of Hermon and just poured it out over Mount Zion. Man, what a blessing that would be, because as that dew would come, it, it would bring with it life, right? It would bring refreshing into this desert land. He says, how amazing that would be that's what unity is like when it's among God's people. Mount Zion is kind of symbolic of Israel and saying, he's saying blessed, they are blessed as they gather together in unity. And then it says there, for, for there the Lord bestows his blessing. That word bestows is an interesting, it's a strong word that means command, meaning that God commands a blessing. It's the only place in the Bible that God commands a blessing, right? And so he's saying, hey, when my people are coming in unity, I'm gonna, I'm gonna send my blessing. And not just an earthly blessing, hey, you're gonna have a good life, but, but an eternal, I'm, I'm giving you life, ultimately through Christ, my son that's gonna come. Well, my people get it right. When the when the church, the promise is this, when the church walks in unity, God commands his blessing to fall. Isn't that awesome? When we walk in unity, when we walk together in the cause that God has given us, the call that God has given us, we can, we can know that his blessing is be, gonna be upon us. God blesses a united church. I, I believe that's one of the reasons why we're experiencing the blessing that we are right now here at First Church. I, in my time here, I, I don't know that there has been a time when we have been more united than we are right now. United under our mission to, to love Jesus and love like Jesus and live that out in our lives. United as we stand on the truth of God's word, 
We use it as our guide. We, we're not wavering from that in a, in a crazy culture we're in that's challenging that. We're sticking to God's word, united in reaching the lost and de church, united in raising up the next generation and, and raising them to love Jesus and pouring into them. We're united. And when we're united, we can trust that God's blessing will be upon us. So we need to keep talking about unity because unity can also be easily lost in a moment. It can go away. I think that's why David is so excited uh, about this in Psalm 133 here, because he's been through the times of Israel's uh, times of dysfunction and disunity in, in their kingdom, but now he's experiencing this unity. He's like, oh, this is amazing. Can we keep this? <laughs> Can we hold on to this? And so he rejoices in this, this season that they are in right now as we should too. So, so today, I, I just wanna answer this question. Uh, why should unity in the church be important to us? Why should unity be important to us? Why, why have you given up this time to come and hear me talk about unity? Hey, yay, this is great, can we go to lunch? Um, I think there's several reasons why we do need to take time to do this. And again, again, this is a good season to talk about. It's kind of like in marriage. If you're gonna talk about things you need to fix in your marriage, the best time to talk about those things is when things are good, right? Don't wait for the arguments and the blow-ups. Hey, while we're fighting, <laughs> can we talk? No. So this is a good time for us to talk about this. One reason I believe it should be, uh, that unity should be so important to us, we should pay attention to it, is because our, our, our unity is important to Jesus. In John 17, John records one of Jesus' last prayers right before he's about to go to the cross. And if you, if you know, if a person knows that they're about to die, you can pretty much just bet that the words they're gonna say, the things that they're gonna share are gonna be important to them. They're gonna waste their time on pointless stuff, right? They're, they're about to die. That's where Jesus is at. And so what he prays for, you can, we can assume is very important to him. So verse 20 of John 17, he says this, my prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, who's them there. He's talking about the disciples. He's just got through praying for the disciples and their unity and what they're gonna do for the kingdom as they launch the church. And now he's shifting gears. I'm not just praying for them. I, I'm praying for those who, who will believe in me through their message. You know who that is? That's us, all right? Jesus is praying for us in this verse. God, I, Father, I'm, I'm praying for those that are gonna come to faith because of the work of the disciples, and, and that's why we're here today, because the disciples took the message out, church took off, so he keeps on going. As he prays for us, he says this, verse 21, that all of them, talking about us, that all of them may be one, there's unity, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. So Jesus is praying for the unity of his followers in this final prayer of his. May they be one like we are, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Trinity. Unity is important to Jesus. And if unity is important to Jesus, that means also what, Antithesis, if it's important to him, that means it's important to Satan, our enemy, who wants to destroy it. Earlier in his prayer, matter of fact, if you back up, he, where he was praying for the disciples, he actually says this, Father, protect them so that they may be one. Why does he say protect them? Because he knows that we are in a battle over our unity. And so he... He prays for protection over his people and over his disciples. And so that's why we have to guard it. That's why we need to talk about it. That's why we need to keep reminding ourselves to, to continue to strive for unity. Because if it's important to Jesus, it should be important to us. Now, now one reason unity is so important to Jesus and should be to us is because of the next thing. Uh, our unity points the lost world to Jesus. 
Jesus continues this, his prayer here in, in John 17, verse 22. He says, I have given them the glory you gave me, purpose, significance that you've given to me, that they may be one as we are one. I and them and you and me, may they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Twice in his prayer. We already heard it up in verse 20, 21. Now again, he says it, that the world's belief in Jesus is contingent on the church's unity so that the world may believe. My God, Father, may, may they be one so that the, the world may believe in me. Listen, the, the world around us is watching us. You know that. The world is watching the church. They're watching how we treat one another. And it's our unity that draws them in, which also means it's our disunity that leads them away, that points them away from Jesus. In my time in ministry, I've seen some things that have angered me, and usually it's surrounding this idea of people in the church doing things that give the church a bad name and ultimately give Jesus a bad name. And one of the worst places that happens is on our social media. When people go on social media to rant about the church, whether it's our church or somebody else's church, for all the world to see, you really wanna talk about the bride of Christ like that? because you're leading the world away from Jesus. Unity is important because the world is depending on it. Unity should be important to us also because unity is a mark of maturity. As we, as we mature in our faith, we should become more united. We have lots of ideas what maturity looks like, should look like, it's Bible knowledge, being able to teach, and those can be marks of maturity. But Paul in Ephesians four and five gives some very practical expectations of what our lives as believers should look like as we mature in our faith. Verse one, Ephesians four, he says this, as a prisoner for the Lord, yes, Paul's in prison while he's writing this, as a prisoner of the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. What calling? A calling to the standards of God's word, a calling to live in unity with one another. He says, live up to that calling. Verse two, he breaks it down. He says, be completely humble and gentle, be patient, bearing with one another in Love. Do you know what unity requires? It requires being humble and gentle and being patient with one another, right? These kind of passive attributes that we have that, that bring about unity. But then Paul says, sometimes we even have to bear with one another. <laughs> I love that. One translation says, making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Sometimes we have to do that, right? Uh, let's just acknowledge it. We're all messed up people, right? Shocker when somebody does something that upsets you. Because <laughs> we're, we're, we still are dealing with sin and a sin nature and we're trying to overcome those things. And, and sometimes we just have to bear with one another. Why? Because we love each other. Because we're all under the headship of Jesus who's showed us the, his ultimate love for us. And so sometimes we just gotta bear with one another. And with humility and gentleness and patience, we bear with one another. Verse three goes on, make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. Why does he say make every effort? Because it's hard. <laughs> it just doesn't happen. We have to work at it. We have to be patient with each other. We have to strive for peace. And notice he says to keep the unity. He doesn't say to create the unity. Unity is provided for us through Jesus. He is, we, we come together in unity under him and his headship. 
unified with a Holy Spirit, one spirit within us. Whenever we do leadership, uh, from time to time, we get to do leadership conferences or, or training with other churches to help their elders as they're establishing elders. One of the things uh, about our eldership, we don't, our, our elders, um, our elders don't vote. Um, there's no voting. It's all by consensus. We all have to, or we, they, uh, they all have to agree and we, when we tell other elderships that, yeah, you all, have to, you all have to agree because you all have the same Holy Spirit within you and so they're, it's gotta all line up. Can't have a two, three vote and say, all right, we, we won. No, no. It's all by consensus because we all wanna be in line with the Holy Spirit and with one another. And some people don't, they're like, well, how's that work? <laughs> it works beautifully, let me tell you. It's a wonderful thing. We're all united under Christ with the Holy Spirit. Then he gives us God's blueprint for his church, 11 and 13 there. It was he who gave some to be apostles and some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors and teachers to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become, here's the word, mature, attaining the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. So unity is a characteristic of maturity in the life of a believer, which also means disunity is often a sign of immaturity in a believer. Now, when we talk unity, we're not, we're not talking about uniformity or conformity. Unity is about being in relationship with one another and, again, sometimes bearing with one another, pressing on through whatever challenges we face, standing with one another despite any differences. And uh, another thing is what we're not talking about is sacrificing truth, okay? We still stand on truth and we hold to that. But we, even in the midst of differences there, we maintain peace. He says, make every effort to keep unity. It sounds so much like what Paul said over in Romans chapter 12, verse 18, where he says, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. He gives two qualifiers. If it's possible, as far as it depends on you. <laughs> it may not be possible, but as far as it goes for you, do everything you can to keep peace with everyone. Last thing is unity should be important to us because a united church can accomplish great things. When we see the church united under the cause of Christ, we see an unstoppable force in this world. And you've heard us use that word unstoppable a lot around here. And we've seen God doing some great things. We saw that. We see that in the early church over in Acts chapter two where the church is just getting started and it talks about over and over again, they were together. Verse 44, all the believers were together and had everything in common, uh, selling everything. Verse 46, every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And then here's what was happening. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. God's blessing was on the people, on the church, because they were together in unity as they were carrying out his mission. God wants to do great things through his church, and he will do so if we are united, if we do it in unity. Unity matters, and it matters most in the church. Apostle Paul when he's talking to Timothy, this young minister who's just getting started in the church, um, he gives him these words. He's giving him all kinds of advice as a young minister. But in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 23, here's what he tells him. Um, Don't have anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments because you know they produce quarrels and the Lord's servant must not quarrel. Instead, he must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. I love that. Hey, Timothy, you're gonna be really tempted to get sucked into some stupid arguments. <laughs> Don't. It'll kill the unity of your church. 
Verse 26, right, right after this, uh, Paul goes on and he says that to get into quarrels uh, or those who get into quarrels and have fall, they have fallen into the devil's trap and are doing his will instead of God's will. We need to guard against finding ourselves in stupid quarrels. We need to make every effort to be in unity with one another. Can you imagine? Can you imagine if the church, when I say the church, I mean capital C church, all churches, all denominations, can you imagine if we were all united to carry out God's mission? Can you imagine the impact that would have on this world? Well, we at least need to do everything that we can do here to be united and to make a difference in this world. Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brothers and sisters to live together in unity. Let's pray. Father in heaven, God, we, we desire to be a church that walks in unity with one another. God, help us to make every effort towards that. Help us to examine our hearts. Help us to examine our minds as we um, deal with situations and struggles. God, we know that we're gonna have hard uh, circumstances that we just have to deal with. But God, as we do, help us to be a people that follow Paul's leading here to be humble and gentle and patient and God, help us to just examine ourselves. Help us to be a church that does all we can to serve you and follow you in unity. And God, we look forward to continuing to see your blessing fall on your church. We love you. It's in Jesus' name, amen.